Well, we're excited for this next one. I'm excited to get these folks together who most of you just met recently, right, for this presentation. So mixing a lot of different people together. So uh, if you want to take a seat and get ready, we'll listen to this chat. Thanks, everyone. I couldn't hear you. OK, yeah, uh, clapping means we're taking Woo. it away. Uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, this talk is called Future Proof. How to thrive amidst, uh, amidst rapid change in entertainment technology. I don't know if we're going to actually talk about any of that, <laughs> but it will be relevant. Um, so I think what we can do is go right into our introductions. Um, I'm Elbers. That might be the first time my last name is on screen. I've been trying to do a thing like share, you know, like the Elbers, just the artist formerly known as. Mm -hmm. um, I'm the co-founder of the Interactive and Immersive HQ. It is a comprehensive online training platform for immersive designers, creative technologists, interactive tech developers. Uh, if you've never heard of us, we do have very nice little cards at the front desk of the check-in that get you a free month access of all of our materials. Definitely check that out. Uh, before that, I founded a company called Envoid about uh, one full hair cycle ago. Um, and that company, which I sacrificed my hair to the gods of success, uh, we were doing touch designer specialty programming. And we worked all over the world with all kinds of big clients. Uh, we've had the victory lap thing. There's a lot of them, and they're big, and they had a lot of money and all that kind of good stuff. And then I started the HQ and really pivoted towards education and empowerment of talent and community because I think like we've been hearing from a lot of folks, uh, especially Ben's talk yesterday, I think did a really excellent job highlighting it, the valley of death in between education and career uh, is a valid one and a terrifying one for both sides of the spectrum. So that's a little bit about me. Isabel, I'll pass it to you. Hello, um, I'm Isabel, and uh, you know I uh, I've been working in this industry for like I would say 40 years. <laughs> I don't want to age myself, but I already am. <laughs> and uh, you know I've been through all kinds of like changes in technology through the years, through the decades. You know things that don't exist anymore, things that are upcoming. You know it's like it's like a crazy roller coaster of things that you have to go through, like you know. Constantly, constantly, you know, and then um, I guess I'll talk about that more later. But before I go there, I'm going to show you a picture of what I do when I'm not doing pushing pixels. So that's me on my motorcycle, my Ducati Let's Fall, like uh, running through the twisties. And then that, is, that was last month, the other one playing bluegrass in a, in a band in Brooklyn. <laughs> All right, I can't be the only one that stalks her Facebook to see those motorcycle photos, right? <laughs> I always think I want to be Isabel when I grow up because I'm, <laughs> like, I'm like, I see that and I'm like, all right, I've got a long way to go. Um, but I'm Patrick Wumbled. I'm a senior solution architect at Epic Games. I work on the Unreal Engine team. Um, and honestly, I just wanted to thank everybody for having me out here. Uh, Laura and JT were very accommodating to try and get me uh, out here to talk with everybody. It's just nice to be able to get to hang out with my friends and kind of do the same thing I used to do, but on the other side. So like now instead of screaming at software devs, I get yelled at. And so like I've kind of, I have a lot more respect for everybody that I used to complain to. I will say that. And, uh, but other than that, it's just nice to share the stage with these two also. We did get a talk at least once before, so it's not brand new, but I don't know a ton about what they do. So this should be interesting for, for all of us, I hope. Perfect. So I think that will take us, I mean, we have a lot of these pictures. Let's. <laughs> They, I was telling Isabel earlier, uh, you see one, you've seen them all. Like, they all kind of yes, look the yes. same. There's a lot of bright lights. There's a bunch of money, drown the drain, yada, yada, yada. Environment, <laughs> yada, yada, yada. So let's get, get to the Tell, tell Amex here. that. That was down the drain. Yeah, literally. let's go to the first question that we have on deck. And I love this Did question. You? Oh, my God. What do you do when asked to work on a project dependent on technology outside of your skill set? Uh, let me tell you the short answer is make somebody else pay for me to learn. Uh, usually, I consider myself a bit of a delayed learner at this point in my life. Uh, as much as I like watching other people be on the cutting edge, I usually wait for somebody to pay me to figure out 
what I got to do with this thing to get the paycheck that I am required to do this thing for. But I think it's an interesting approach, and especially the talk, uh, the panel that was on previous, talking about risk, innovation, figuring out where you can take risks, how you can take risks. I think this is a really core life skill to have in this industry, which is A, risk management, but what I talk to a lot of students about and a lot of people earlier in their careers is also stress management and self-care. And yeah, I know you're gonna be like, oh, this guy's gonna, I was gonna ask, so how many people in the room do uh, like mindfulness meditation? Give me like a hand up. Okay, not That's enough. That's way more how many than people, I thought. Yeah, how though. many people doing like <laughs> yoga? Give me like a couple of yogis in the room. Hmm. Uh, how many people do exercise regularly? Oh my God, we are so fit. Bunch of it. liars. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. And how many people have hobbies? Like this is a weird question. I'm very new to this hobby game, but like, okay, do you guys have hobbies? Because I find one of the challenges that I had early in my career was that work was everything, and I didn't take care of myself. And I think this is a common situation that a lot of folks get into, which is indirectly and directly related to this question because what I found that, you know, we're naturally I'm a stress sponge. So if I'm in a room with other people and they're stressed, I can like SpongeBob up their stress and then they feel like chill, but I'm like dying on the inside. <laughs> But it allowed me to take on more risk in terms of, yeah, somebody comes up to me and says, we're going to do water projection. I'm like, I've never done water projection, but I'm going to just nod my head and be like, totes, bro. Like, we're going to project this shit out of this water. <laughs> and then I'd have to go online and, like, figure out, like, what is water projection? And then you learn about, like, nozzles, and you're like, what? And then there's, like, the water curtains. You're like, oh, my God, there's, like, a lot of shit involved with this. Um, but a lot of that, to me, came down to this idea, which you'll hear me talk about a lot is self-care. And yeah, we can even go to the next slide. I mean, you've seen, them, you've seen one, you've seen them all. There's a bunch of projects we worked on. They all kind of look good, whatever. Um, but it's this idea that in any of these projects I worked on, whatever the pictures are, there was always something I didn't know. And a lot of the time, that something was a big portion of the thing itself. And the only way I was able to approach it was to pace myself, be kind to myself in a sense of like, okay, if I don't understand it today, that's okay. Maybe I'll understand it tomorrow. Let me try and chip away at that. Um, and I think that's been a really important thing in, in my kind of journey of learning how to use new skills. And I know you guys have different experiences with learning new technologies. Yeah, well, you know, it's it's maybe different different industry or different application or, but it's the same thing. It's like, you know, sometimes you get asked projects to do it. So. What is this thing? You know, how how do you approach this? You know, how how do you even like wrap your mind around it? You know, and then as you say, you know, you have to talk to people and you have to like figure out and you have to. There's like big teams always in the projects I work on. I do a lot of like large corporate shows, you know, for like global companies all around the world, and uh, you know, it's like. There's a constant consultation between all the team players, you know, and then, you know, you have creative directors, one of my friends here in the front row. <laughs> and, uh, you know, they have like technical directors, you have like uh, mapping experts, like uh, pixel counts, like lighting designers, like audio designers, you know, there's original music, original lighting, everything is custom. Everything is for a show that lasts one day. So basically a production lasts for like two months, you know, for one day. So everything has to go perfect, you know? And, you know, so it's a constant learning, you know? Because, you know, it's a constant new challenge. So every challenge is different. Not, I mean, no show is the same as the, as the last one. <coughs> so that's... Yeah, I, I don't know. Honestly, on this question, it there's a lot of different levels where this can happen. And like my usual answer is like, well, I mean, as long as you're not way over your skis, like fake it till you make it. <laughs> I can like, I hate to say that, but you know, sometimes it does require taking a leap into something super uncomfortable in order to learn it. You know, like you said, waiting until that job comes that then you're like, you know, I've been putting off learning like Unreal Engine uh, or something like that until it comes along and you have to have that thing, you know, that specific thing. But I've noticed this depends on where you are in the chain sometimes because like obviously at Epic, like we have a ton of resources. So if I don't know what the heck it is, there's probably somebody who does internally. So I have a huge internal network. But back when I was freelance, that wasn't the case. So I relied a lot more on my 
external network and you know and that was all the people in this room and in like all the you know discord chats and stuff like that like somebody would have the answer but you know i see this a lot where this is where you end up with a lot of sub hires though too right you know somebody will hire an ad agency who will hire somebody else a production company and eventually gets kicked down to and i'm like oh cool i know the xr studios guys there's the ones who are going to actually do the work you know it's just like there's like three layers of the stuff in between there um, so sometimes it's sub hiring, you know, but other, you know, other times, you know, that's the time to double down and like really like learn that new thing that maybe you just didn't like the AI talk that was happening earlier. I'm like, I'm going to get on Kubrick like, like right now. <laughs> so like, but that's exactly, you know, it takes something like maybe seeing it to want to jump in. So. And I think we can move on to the next question as well, because they're all really related in the sense that it may feel like we're not talking about the future because we feel like we're talking about the present, but that's because when you remove this technology equation, when you remove the shiny objects of like what's cool today, what's cool yesterday, what's cool tomorrow, the fundamentals that we're talking about in terms of, you know, how do we learn, constantly learning, managing your stress, those are the things that are gonna last a career. Those are the things that are gonna travel and keep you successful through whatever ups and downs that are coming your way, as opposed to being like, oh, I'm just so good at this one thing, but I like don't want to learn. Oh my God, it doesn't matter how good you are at that one thing. Like it, it that wall is coming real soon. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no, you're good. So escape me, but I'm gonna go to the next. I'm gonna move to yeah, the next yeah, question. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and thank yes. you to Isabel also who volunteered to put our slides together, which is why they look so beautiful. Yep. Uh, and you're about to see like animations and yes, yes, a round of applause. Yeah, <laughs> she did a really good job. The unsung work of a hero. Okay, so. This is my question. Oh, wait a minute. Yes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Time to Isabel. Yes. <laughs> Sorry, I'm a little nervous. I never speak in public, but uh, I think this is a, a trick question. I, I, I don't agree with this question. I mean, we discussed possible questions, and this came up as a possibility in the list, and it's like, okay, well, I'll take that one. So basically, my first approach when I see this question is this. I cross that out. Because, <laughs> because, you know, I disagree. I was like, what is more valid? I mean, the experience we all have, you know, it's like it changes through the years and then that does make it generalists or specialists, you know? But, you know, because I think we become specialists in what we do all the time, you know? And then sometimes you have to take the role of a generalist and sometimes you have to take the role of a specialist in different areas, you know? So. I rephrase the question to, am I a generalist or a specialist? You know, because to me, I ask myself the question, you know, and then I try to answer, you know. I'm gonna put my, my pretty background here while I try to answer some of that. <laughs> Here's a, some stuff with some things I worked through the years. This is mostly recent stuff, yeah. But, um, that's me in the corner. <laughs> uh, losing my religion. <laughs> okay, I'm glad I wasn't the only one thinking that, because uh, I was like, all right. Yeah, anyway, so I'm gonna go trying to answer the question. I have five little stories. I don't know if I'm gonna be able to cover all of them, but I'm gonna try to make them very short, okay? So the Prado Museum. I was 14 years old, and then my dad, you know, came for dinner, you know, it's like he had been working on this project for the Prado Museum about the Goya exhibit, the dark paintings, all these aquilaries and witches, and all the paintings are like basically black with some brown, brown faces and things like that, you know. And then he said, you know, we have a problem. We, the exhibit is it starts tomorrow, and I know you have a good mind, and you have a good head, I need your help tonight. So we go to the Prado Museum, <laughs> and it has like 12 screens <laughs> over there. I'm talking, this is like early 80s, you know, late 70s. I was really young. And then, and then I'm looking at this thing fascinated. It's like, oh my God, what is this thing? <laughs> you know, the first, my first immersion, my first contact with multimedia as a, you know, as a, an, an exhibit, you know? First of all, I have to say that the computer was like the size of a refrigerator. You know, it was like this giant thing. It has like this punch tape with like little relays, like clicking things. And you know, and then with 
tape rolling, you know, it was like, it was crazy. But, you know, I mean, we solved the problem. We stayed all night at the Prado Museum in the Goya, in the Goya Gallery, which was amazing to me. And then uh, the point to me is like, this is where I got fascinated with this industry. That's when I got me into this, wow, this is amazing. You know, it's like, I want to do this, you know. So I'm going to fast forward like 10 years. Oh, sorry. The king and I. <laughs> you know, I was, uh, after I had been working in this business for like several years, you know, and then we did it like this, we did this uh, uh, multimedia experience with like lasers and lights and film projectors. Everything was like slides. We were, computers, graphics didn't exist yet, you know. We did this, we put it in a trade show in Madrid and then the king came to the trade show he went through the whole trade show, but he missed the arena <laughs> where we had our experience. So like a, a week later, like we get a call from the Department of Tourism in Spain. It's like, so the king wants to see the experience and you had to bring it to his house. <laughs> so it's like, okay, well, you know, we did like a scouting a little bit. Yet we bring the whole gear to the house, like, you know, and then this, I mean, the king's house is, is not, a small thing, you know. I mean, it was not the palace, but it was like where he lives, you know. It's like much more comfortable than the palace, right? And then we go in there in kind of like a big living room, you know, it's like a really small room. I mean, we had we came from an arena to, to a living room with somebody, like a large living room with somebody. We set up everything, we run the thing. The queen first came and said, you cannot talk to the king unless he talks to you. And this is how you address the king and this blah, blah. So she was like, like the project manager of the of the royal house. <laughs> and, and then we do, we, do, we run the thing. They look at it. They say, "Oh, this is beautiful." And then the king looks behind, and I'm sitting behind the computer, which was controlling all the stuff, you know. And then it's like, "Are you running this thing?" It's like, "Yeah." And then he comes. He sits next to me. Like, can you show me how it works? This is really cool. <laughs> So I'm mean, pointing at the screen, like, oh, see, this is the time code, and this is the clock that counts the time synchronized with the music, and this is li this little flashing lights. So, you know, I'm not going to go into that detail. <laughs> but anyway, 10 years, fast forward 10 years, I started working on widescreen shows with, like, projection, you know, digital, you know, animation, movement, stuff like that. I'm talking 2003. So... We, were, we went from like regular screens to like wide screens. And then it's like, oh, I think I, I need a computer that can run moving backgrounds and can do animations and lens flares and things and can blah, 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 you know. So that didn't exist. I'm talking 2003, there's, there was no watch out and there was no disguise yet. They came out like uh, 2005, something like that. I was working for an agency at the moment. So I said, well, you know, Let's, let's put a computer together, put a couple of disk arrays, a lot of memory, some like graphic card, the fastest graphics card, and then we start doing like a widescreen shows. So my first widescreen show I go, and I had made moving backgrounds and the speaker intros, the speaker, I will, I will put the music that they play on, you know, I'll play all the videos, and then the stage manager on, on headset says, you know, video has to come from video, and audio has to come from audio. <laughs> I said, no, but this is the future. <laughs> anyway, there was some skepticism there. <laughs> so I used that successfully like seven years, you know. In the meantime, these guys, and watch out, watch out them first, and these guys, they came along, and then uh, they started, you know. I left that company. I couldn't commercialize the product that I had made. You know, I had like a custom code and stuff like that to make it work. And then I started working independently, but I kept using the system for a while, you know. And then one day a client comes to me and says, hey, we have a show for like a French cosmetic company in Paris in a, in a planetarium. Can you make an IMAX experience movie, like three minutes with like the products lying around and stuff like that? I said, an IMAX movie. <laughs> and then, you know, you have to like, okay. So I had to figure out how to make an IMAX movie. You know, and then we contacted IMAX, uh, IMAX Labs. It's like, okay, what's the format? What's the pixel count? What's the pixel resolution? How long does it take to process the film? 
what, you know, blah, 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 all that stuff. I say, well, you know, we can't help you because our lab is completely booked with Kung Fu Panda too. <laughs> so they didn't have any room for uh, to process this opening experience that was supposed to be in this planetarium, a spherical map in Paris, right? I said, well, well you, can, you can try our lab in, in London anyway. Long story short, we made it work. It was amazing. It was like completely like, you know, it was like mind blowing. You were there in this time, time you seeing all these like gigantic products, <laughs> like mascaras and eyeshadow, something like that. <laughs> you know, anyway, flying around, you know. Anyway, so that, fast forward. Now we're in the 2016 or 15, 16. And then, and then some client sends me a, a set rendering with like 15 screens, like all kinds of shapes, curves, floating, like moving. Some of the, some of the screens were like dynamic. They were like, in, like uh, with motors and things like that, you know. And then I look at their at the set rendering and then I tell to my client, are you out of your mind? <laughs> because it was, it was like, this, it was, I have never done anything so big in my life, you know? But, you know, fortunately, most of my clients are friends because we go through so much working together in such like crazy ideas, you know, that we, we become friends because it's like such a intimate relationship of working together, you know? So 100 million pixels, what? <laughs> That's what I can show some pictures and I'm gonna soup through them super fast because we still have a lot to talk about. Yep. <laughs> so, this was the one look from the from the front of the house. You know, this was for like ten thousand people or eight thousand people, I believe. So, what you can see all these people down here. This is us. You know, this is us. This is the people who are in this business, and this is just part of the setup. The whole this guy's setup, because at this point we were using these guys already, was on the left side of the house, and there's some other apartment on the right side. But you can see that it takes it takes an army to put together something like that, and really you need to talk to all these people all the time, you know, to consult and then figure out, test things, you know. So this is like a, this. Sorry, this is for my iPhone, and then I was working on a kind of like a walking loop kind of thing, you know. So, but you know, I have to render everything at 100 million pixels. There's no real time rendering in these cases, you know. And this is me, my computer in my in my office in Brooklyn, you know, in Manhattan. It's working on some of these animations, you know. You can see they've got 64 projectors and you know, anyway, so but you know, it's a very different when you look at it in your screen and when you walk into that space. When you walk into a space, you see this like giant thing that is so overwhelming. You know, I, I mean I can, I could picture, I could imagine how the screens were moving. And, but I could only see it on my little screen. And then when I walked in there, I, my heart stopped for a minute, you know, for a moment. It's like, wow, this is incredible, you know? Right? I mean, this is why. <laughs> anyway, that's another show. I'm just gonna go through this very fast during setup. The lighting here is beautiful, you know. Uh, this is more pictures of the same show, some other show, some other show. I work, we work on that together. Uh, Oops, sorry. So you see the size of the people. It's always like a, it's always this giant like experience. This is some building mapping in LA. This is another show that uh, I was working along with Rafik Anadol. No, I wasn't working along with him. He, this was his show. And then my client asked me, "Can you make something like Rafik Anadol to go in between his his shows?" I was like, "Well, <laughs> how you know?" <laughs> I go, well, okay, well, I'll try. <laughs> I'll try. So I came up with this like a thing, you know, uh, which is kind of some kind of like a galaxy particles, kind of like a fluid, uh, like 12 million cubes uh, done in notch, you know, and then it like, you know, we mapped it into in disguise and stuff like that. Um, this was a prototype for the interactive wall with uh, laser sensors. Uh, this was something else we did in New York a few years ago before COVID. This is some other show that we did with dancers. And uh, and then we were digitizing the dancers because sometimes the dancers were on screen as well as live on stage. 
and then here's a moment, uh, transitions, and then we had digitized this dancer in some studio. It's gonna show up as Da Vinci, you know, and, and then he's dancing inside the cube, and then the other dancers are there. You know, I mean, this was like 20,000 people, I believe, you know, it's like, 12, 11 screens? 11 screens, I think, yeah. Well, it's interesting, because like, <laughs> every one of these is, like, individually a highly specialized thing, right? Yeah. Like, you know, if you think about it. But if you look at them all together as, like, a collage, you would think, oh, well, she's a generalist, right? She can do all these different things. There's, you know, 10 different, you know, disciplines that she's showing. So it's kind of interesting how sometimes they both work together, you know? And so, I don't know, the question was asked about, you know, are we going to be more specialists or generalists? I've always been like a jack of all trades kind of master of none person, and especially now, working over at Epic, like no one person knows all of Unreal. Like there is, it's just impossible. Um, but that's not to say you don't need specialists. You know, I mean, you do. Like when you get to that point where you're like, wow, we need to squeeze every ounce of performance out of this thing, you might need a specialist. Or back when you had flame operators and things like that, like. When you're like, we can only do this on this one platform. Uh, you know, we just can't get the look any other way. So I don't think there's any like wrong answer to that, but like I just I the thing I caution anybody about who kind of is like too specialized is just like you kind of then turn your mind off to new opportunities. You know, again, like if you're you know, if you've invested your entire life into 2D animation and you saw the first 3D animation box, you would be like, Great, I've just I've just wasted my life, you know. And so you know, it's not to say that you can't be a specialist and still like do that kind of stuff, but I think it just it kind of closes your mind off. And so I always encourage people like you know be be curious, right? If you tell <laughs> like you know not judgmental, right? So, and I think there's a really interesting element going back to what Isabel kind of renamed the slide to is whether am I a generalist or a specialist? And I think there's a really valuable act of self-reflection in there because I think we're at a point in the industry where both are commercially viable. Uh, highly functioning teams, as Patrick was saying, you will have some specialists who are the gurus of a thing, and you will have a bunch of people who are great at a bunch of tools, and they're not experts at anything. Mm -hmm. And that sounds to me like a highly functioning team. We got people that can really solve tight, tight little problems, really squeeze optimization, and we got people who and a lot of times they're just great content folks. They can hop into Notch, Unreal, Touch Designer, Max MSP, put together a lot of really interesting things. And I think there is a little bit of just understanding what your personality is like. Because I come from a little bit of a different background is in that I am a specialist in the sense that I am a Touch Designer specialist by training. And I spent 10 years basically trying to be like LeBron James, a touch designer. I'm not going to lie. Like, that's how I kind of, like, imagine myself in my head. Wow. Uh, wow. No, I know, I know. Humble brag there. <laughs> uh, and, and Rich Paul got a shoe deal now, so I'm like, Nike, like, sure. where are my shoes, dog? Like, let's, let's work on some shoes. Um, but the joking aside is, is for my personality, I really like getting obsessive about a thing. And I could sit, and I remember, like, I would be sitting in front of a touch designer screen for 12 hours a day just eating it up. Just om nom 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 like a little like corn on the cob all day long. I and back then when you learned touch designer, it meant just like reading wiki. I read the like the whole wiki like top to bottom and I'm like this is my favorite reading material. Like I love the wiki. Um and I made a whole career out of that. Now it's a little bit different now because I think with the power of tools and the accessibility they have, you know, an intermediate at Unreal or touch designer is kind of capable of what an expert used to be able to do and was required to do in these similar tools. Uh, so I think it really does open up a lot of potential and not to get too deep into it, but I, I think an interesting concept we were talking about on the phone previously was like this T-shaped skill set, which is a concept like I didn't invent by any stretch, but I kind of been like preaching the gospel of because I really appreciated how it worked. Where if you think of the top of the T, and I kind of have to like move my head with the mic as I'm like gesturing, but like the top of the T is things that you're just learning, things that you're a beginner of, things that I think are useful to you because it gives you communication ability when you're on a team to be able to talk to somebody in a little bit of a better language. And then you might, if you're a specialist, just have one stem on your T that just goes real all the way down to the floor. Whereas if you're a generalist, you might say, you know what, I'm gonna make two or three stems from this T. I really like these two or three platforms. Let me become like pretty proficient, not a guru by any stretch, but let me get into the intermediate or higher intermediate stage of them and become a really effective 
uh, person on a team. And I think that's that's an interesting concept we're throwing on this yeah. shaped idea. Well, it was really weird too, because like just thinking about this in terms of like what you know, where when I was back, kind of freelancing, doing shows and events and stuff like that, like I would see a lot of what I would call like one man and one woman armies. You know, where like there was like one person who like made the content, ran the lighting desk, like, you know, and like made the content was also 10 things, right? It's like you could model, you could texture, you you lit the scene yourself, you rendered it at home or in a render farm, you know, and like that's, that's an insane like like level of like knowledge and trying to find more people like that or God forbid that person had to bail on a tour and replace that person like that is a tough ask anymore and the, and the other thing that like I I kind of cringe saying this but you know but it you know that one person is not going to create like the Mandalorian right like you know that's just not the level that they're looking for you know and it's a different it's a different thing so different teams and different projects are going to acquire different skill sets so that's kind of why I lean towards more of like being a generalist because like I never wanted somebody to be like, oh, you know what? I mean, now it's too late. They're like, that's the unreal guy. But like, you know, I never wanted to be that before where they're like, oh, all he does is program moving lights. He doesn't know how to do like media <laughs> servers. Like, and I was like, I, that's not true. I can do that, you know? And so uh, I was just always anxious to do more. And so for me, that's, that was my answer. Like you said, are you one or the other? Like you kind of gravitate towards one or the other. I don't think there's a wrong answer. Yeah, so what I did is I reworked that question, are you a generalist? Am I a generalist or a specialist? I, I changed it to this one. What drives us, you know, because what we do, I mean, it changes all the time. And it's like we, we strive to make it happen, to make it work. And then, you know, and this is like, that's part of the challenge, it's part of our challenge. That's our specialty, you know? I mean, the specialty, the technology, it changes all the time, you know? It's like, oh, are you a specialist on this, on that, you know? And then the specialists shift and change and they learn new things and they leave things behind, you know? And then, but one of the most important thing as an answer to this question, what drives us? I put these five, I mean, and you're welcome to comment on any of them, of course, you know, but to me, it's amazing working with amazing people all the time, you know? From top to bottom to all the aspects of the production, it's, it's just amazing. I love working with these people, with all these people, with you guys, you know? Right now, the way the fast, the, the speed the technology is changing, you can basically get updated every week, you know? I mean, I part of week, several week, beta programs. really? <laughs> yeah, every week. Like hourly, right? <laughs> You know, like, it's, especially with AI, you know, yeah. collaboration is more crucial than ever, you know, collaboration with people who uh, we are the experts in the industry. So I think we should like work together as much as we can, because sometimes somebody knows something that somebody else doesn't know, you know, specialties are constantly, constantly updated and we always pushing, pushing boundaries, you know, and then AI is a real revolution. It's like it's in its infancy, but it's going to change everything, the way we do everything. I mean, we may not be able to put together like 100 million pixel show, but it's definitely changing broadcast and it's changing, you know, I mean. And one thing I think that's like really interesting about this is the idea that collaboration is more crucial than ever, and I think that's a really important element to focus on, and I think it was... Laura, who was mentioning yesterday at the end of one of the panels, and I, I think it was when we were talking to, to during Ben's talk, how do we expose folks to collaborative environments to build their collaboration skill earlier in their journey so that we don't end up with what I think a lot of the times happens now, which is people get good at stuff and they haven't really collaborated, then they're dropped into these high pressure team environments and you're trying to figure out like, oh, well, I'm good at something, but I'm completely running around like a headless chicken because I have no idea who I have to ask this question to. I don't know the hierarchy of this like operation. Uh, I don't know the language that a lot of these different softwares use. And I think that's one of the things that I've found to be really productive in, in my practice and something that I always try and, and communicate to folks in our school is that there is so many ways that just understanding what somebody else does can be really valuable to you. Uh, I know a personal thing that I've been doing a lot lately is I just put on uh, tutorials of other platforms I have no intention of ever learning. Uh, and I can put those on in the background, 
And for example, I could talk all day about Niagara module scripts. I have no idea how to build one or what the interface looks like, but I could talk all day about like, oh yeah. Neither. Your texture comes <laughs> in in the module scripts. We can do a lot of custom sampling. We've got some UVs, all kinds of stuff. But I think that then, the power that it gives me is that I can work on a team with somebody who is actually proficient at that. And I just understand a little bit what they're going through I understand that if I'm interfacing with them, how I may want to change my approach, how they might want to change their approach. So I think that the collaboration also comes with the element of communication. And I, I think uh, just a really quick little end of this is that I think some people, there's always this question of like, do you like to work alone or do you like to work on teams? It doesn't matter, you gotta communicate in either one. Like it, if you don't have the skills of being able to communicate, working alone is gonna be very difficult. If you don't have the skills of communication, working on teams is gonna be difficult. And I think being able to practice that, and this is a great place for it because there's so many folks you just get to communicate with and chit chat and learn about their work. So many great resources online, so many free ones, paid ones, whatever. Just throw them on in the background and, and learn how other people are communicating, I think is a really crucial skill. I mean, now it's easier than ever to collaborate, though, too, right? <laughs> I mean, like, you know, the pandemic, like, really kind of pushed that forward, I think, in a way that maybe we weren't forced to before. We're like, I mean, now I sit on Zoom all day. I mean, you know, that was something that, you know, we would do occasionally. But, like, now it's like, oh, yeah, every everybody's available. Everybody's got, which is another whole topic of wellness and stuff that maybe we can do another time. But, um, yeah, collaborating between teams and especially cross-pollination between industries because, I mean, we all know all this stuff is coming together, right? Like, this is not new news, I hope, to anybody. But, like, you know, we see it all the time where everything is related now. You can have one kind of, you know, like when you look at well, like what these mega franchises are doing, you know, like a Marvel or something like that, where you're like, we've got a game, we've got a book series, we've got comic books, we've got TV, we've got streaming. There's, a, you know, there's all these things, and they're all kind of converging together. And so the more you can get a little bit of experience from all of those, the better you're going to be positioned for the future and the stuff. And like, that's not even to leave out like actual businesses like enterprise, you know, and the same thing, like they all, you know, they all use these same tools too, whether you know it or not. And it's not just for corporate presentations, like they use it for visualization, for digital twins, for marketing, for all kinds of things. So I think we had one more question though. So <laughs> let's see if we can Before we knock it out. Move into that one, I just want to oh show yeah, you got to show your Before we move into screen. that one, I have to show you a picture of my living room during COVID because we had to adapt so fast. So this is my living room. This is the air conditioner on the right. <laughs> I'm using my TV as an output monitor. I had to get feeds from all the stage managers. You know, it's like being backstage, but in your living room, you know? But you, and you had to set it all up, you know? Like NDI connections, like you name it. Anyway, that's a, I thought it was a funny picture. So I'm, I'm gonna go to the next one. So I would like to answer this very quickly, which is the topic of this panel. How to thrive in this rapid change amidst rapid change in entertainment technology. So I don't know if you guys want to like, but I think we covered all this, you know, it's, it's, it's about being passionate, you know, constant curiosity for like what's changing and what's coming. Learning the new as, as a life philosophy, because that's where, this is a business we're in. We have to learn in the new stuff all the time, you know, and you have to reinvent yourself every day or in, in every project, or every month, or whenever, whenever that comes. I mean, it's just an expression, right? It's just an expression, what? <laughs> <laughs> it's just an expression. All right, do we, uh, do we, like, I, I, like, when I saw her set up again, I was like, see what I mean about wanting to be her when I grow up? Because, uh, <laughs> I was like, that is way better than what I had, so. Well, we have one more question, but uh, that was- We'll go over time, it's fine. But should we go through it? Yeah, yeah, why not, sure. Well, oh, no, I'm sorry, what was the? Right, right, right. Well, My yes, personal yeah, approach. This one. This one. Uh, yes. Yeah. Personal approach to this. Um, it's one of those things, at least for me, where I'm sure, like everybody else, you have a laundry list of things you would like to learn, and they kind of just usually go into a, you know, some sort of a task or reminders thing for me, and usually I forget about it. So. What I actually had to do is literally just set aside time. It sounds stupid, but like if you schedule it, you'll probably do it. If it's not in your calendar, at least for me, I don't even know. I don't know where I'm going tomorrow unless I can look in my calendar and see it's there. Uh, so for me, that, it was something that luckily uh, my lead over at Epic was, is, he's pretty passionate about this. He's like, you guys need to take some time, you know, set aside a certain amount of hours a week to learn something new because like there's just so much out there. And if you don't force yourself to do it, you're going to have to figure it out eventually. And so... Um, 
for me, it's a, that's kind of where I get to it. It's like I just have to set aside the time, schedule it in there, know that's what it's for, and this is the hardest part. I have to turn off everything else because, like, you know, if I'm getting Slack messages, I'm not paying attention. You know, if I'm getting emails, I'm not listening. You know, it's something that it requires active participation, at least for me. Um, but, you know, for other people, they can just, like he said, listen in the background and kind of, no, nah, I got to be a little more engaged than that, you know, especially, you know, listening to somebody talk about a really complex topic like neural or, you know, radiance fields, <laughs> stuff like that. Like, I have to have a little bit more uh, just, like, paying attention. So, the, yeah, uh, but quick follow-up question. I, I'm just curious is how much time do you set aside? Because I think that's always something that's a little bit different for everybody. Is it like a big chunk? Like, are you setting 90-minute 90 blo 90 blocks? Uh, blocks? I mean, to me, I don't know about you guys, but it takes me a long time to, like, like sometimes get into something. So I try to get a little deep work in if I can. Usually, like, a two-hour block is, like, what I, the minimum amount of time two that hours, I can, you know. At least two hours. Yeah, half an hour. I'm like, it, again, it depends on what it is, the topic sometimes. But, like, so... For example, like a couple of us, like every Friday we do, you know, where we, we're kind of beta test some of the new tools that aren't available yet, right? And so we just got to set aside time to do that. And then usually I have another couple hours each night that I try and like learn something else that's not Unreal because I spend all day doing that. So I'm like, why not? I need to get my head out of that a little bit and kind of just like go to these other things. But, you know, I mean, anything can help. It could be, you know, sometimes you got to Sometimes you got to force yourself at like a conference, you know, or something like that. Or like with lighting, I took the MA2 or MA3 for MA2 users thing. Like I had to force myself to do it because I tried to watch YouTube videos and I was like, this is just not cutting it. So I just had to block off the time. So um, I don't know if you guys want to answer it or if we're going to do Q&A or uh -huh. what. <laughs> I think, yeah, we can go into Q&A actually. I think we're like, out of time. Thank you everyone so much for their time. Please give them a round of applause. But we do have a few moments for questions for these folks. If you have any, we have a couple mics around. Give us that good stuff, the hard-hitting stuff. Where are the journalists in the audience? Ooh. So everyone is just richly rich and successful. There's no questions about thriving in the future. No one's scared about the future. <laughs> I'm terrified. No one do, else is terrified? I got one for you, Elvers. How do you, as you're with your guys' program, you teach new technology. How do you know what new technology to teach and like learn it at the same time that you're teaching it? You know what I mean? Like, how do you keep up with that sort of speed of things? That is a good question, which I, I think it ties in a little bit to how we as professionals choose what to learn. Um, and I think it for me, being like mainly an educator now, I do feel a little bit of like responsibility for because we can't make unlimited content. So if we're making content, like, what are we making it about? And I think there's a lot of factors that are probably similar to what we make as professionals, which is what might the longevity of this skill be? How useful might it be creatively? How useful might it be financially? Um, there's also a little bit of, and I think this is probably something game devs talk a lot about, which is what does the uh, person learning need that they don't know they actually need? Because uh, there's a lot of skills that we kind of try and cover from like business side of things. I mean, I, there's literally my favorite workshop. I'm not gonna lie, is the one I made, uh, obviously. But um, it is. I, humble brag again. <laughs> I, I, I love to hear myself talk. It's a situation. Uh, I open Google Docs and I have an NDA, an SLA, an SOW, an MSA, and I literally just read them line by line, explaining every single line of these contracts in like English and telling people where they should either fight for changes if they see a bad one, or concede changes to get bargaining power later. Oh, I love this workshop, it's so good. Other people, it's one of those things where they don't know they need it yet. But I'd be curious as well, because I think it's similar to how we choose personally to learn skills. Yeah, I uh, I go through that a lot, and basically, you know, every time I make a project, and sometimes I make projects that, are things that I've never done before, but then, you know, I always like looking into the technology, what other people are doing or interested in what I see. I spend a lot of time online looking for things or seeing, oh, look at this. Or, you know, and then there's always something that picks my, picks my interest. It's like, you know, and I cannot say what it is going to be next. You know, right now it's AI. I've been working on it for like six months, something like that. And I started working on it with general, generative adversarial networks like three years ago. Oh, this is new, but you know, it was it was wasn't really working that well three years ago. <laughs> but you know, but now it seems to be working. So I've been trying to learn how to use it, and I already used it in three projects. 
So I don't know what's the next technology, but you know, I don't know How about you, Patrick. I'm a little biased, so I might have to pass on that. <laughs> but uh, I mean, for me, like I usually, it's like there's enough stuff internally that I could just kind of just try and learn more of the tool set that we have. But again, I think that just kind of narrows your scope a little bit. And so, like I, I, don't know, I, I hate to say, like it's almost like FOMO that drives like what I'm looking at. I look at what other people are doing, and I'm like that is cool stuff. Like, I need to know what they're doing. And and honestly, like, that's kind of what drives me a little bit. Like, I don't know if it's a healthy way to look at it, but, like, I'm just like, all right, that's that's something interesting. So, that counts. Like, for instance, Oops, when I learn something new, I'm going to use it in the next show, you know? Yeah. One last question here over on the side. I, I was wondering, uh, you know, we're, not, we're all working on bigger projects. They're all international. They're different time zones. They're different languages. What tools do you use or how do you learn tools that help you collaborate better? And then how do you manage that uh, information as it flows back and forth between your clients and you as the creator? I can start with just a quick one because uh, what's really fun is our school's team is fully remote, like we're a fully remote company. Um, and one of the things that I find I learned from that that I carry over into professional projects is patience, readjusting expectations around communication, and then making sure that everyone also has similar set expectations. Because I think that's probably the number one thing is that once people are in different time zones and all this kind of stuff, you can't just say, hey, I have a quick question for you and wait for them to say yes and then get the answer. You kind of have to put a little bit more effort into your message forward so that they have everything they need when they are about to answer it, and then they kind of give you everything that they can coming back. And I think setting that expectation throughout the process has been like a really major thing for me. I don't know if you guys Yeah, I mean, learning to work asynchronously is definitely a skill. You know, I mean, it's either a blessing or a curse. Like, I love it because somebody's working overnight while I'm sleeping, you know, and like, so to me, it's great. Like, I get up and like, oh, cool, look, they pushed the ball a little further forward. And so, but it does take a lot of, you know, com communication is obviously the top of this one. Like, I don't know, like, I always kind of have to do this talk where I'm like, all right, you know, we're, we're big on source control, we're big on collaboration, but these tools are not a substitute for communication. Like, you, I can't tell somebody's intent by whether or not they checked out a file. Like, I need to know why, I need to know what other ramifications are behind it, and so communication is still key on any of these types of things. I mean, we use all kinds of tools, it just depends on the team. So I don't think it's so much the tool as it is just making, like you said, knowing who you're working with and kind of setting that up ahead of time helps tremendously. So, but I think we're out of time. We are. <laughs> yeah. Cool, well, thank, thank you so you much all. everyone. You can find these lovely folks elsewhere, I'm sure. <laughs> and We'll, we'll be back at 4.10 on stage with a presentation from Four Wall. So please uh, come on back in. There won't be anything in B after this point, so just on A. Thanks. <laughs>